So, we just heard from a couple very accomplished real estate investors and coaches. Um, I know that you, all three of you guys, have your own real estate investment strategies. Let's talk about that. So, Rob, we'll start with you. Uh, yeah, so we're in the right business and you have opportunities out there. So, I'm always, you know, looking at what's coming up, uh, in, whether multi residential or small commercial or commercial properties. So, every one of you, that is a realtor out there should be investing all the time. So multi-residential, uh, small commercial I get involved with. And uh, and you know what, I'll, I'll tell you, going to functions like this and seminars and you know, you know, listening to podcasts and everything, it drives you to and, and buy uh, another property and, and you know, and just, just learning and, and you grow actually if, if you are uh, going to functions like this. It's just, I, I'm telling you, every time I go to a function or a seminar, I end up buying another property. Just, it just motivates you because you get out of that rut, you just keep going, it just opens up your brain because there's so much knowledge at these uh, conferences. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah, I was just going to say, uh, I, I totally echo that when it comes down. My strategy for real estate investment has been pretty simple. It's always been, you know, buy, hold, and wait. And then eventually refi after five years, right? Um, I think to Rob's point there, it's really important though too because you come to a seminar like this, and I remember going to multifamily with uh, Rob, and you're gonna hear from Conrad, and it's very common to doubt your investment strategy, I find. I've many oftentimes left an event being like, fuck, I'm doing it all wrong. <laughs> but then I go home and I'm like, you know what, no, it's okay, my strategy's okay, it still works. And I think the idea is that do your strategy, stick with your strategy, continue to evolve with your strategy. Go into commercial real estate. So that's what I did. Started buying small buildings and went into commercial. And commercial was a lot better uh, and, and the growth was, was really, really good. Uh, and, and you could manage it and you're dealing with business people and, and there's less trauma. Now come full circle, now I have such a commercial uh, portfolio that the idea of things changing, COVID, office space, uh, retail, all that kind of thing happening. I thought I wanted to balance my portfolio, and now we are uh, embarking on uh, residential. So we are building purpose-built uh, apartment buildings. We have 220 units under construction right now. We'll be renting them. Uh, we'll be leasing the first four floors come July, August next year, and we have four more purpose-built rentals on the go. Uh, we're probably going to. We'll, within the next eight years, we'll get to 1,200 units. Um, you know, barring nothing uh, changing and stuff like that. So we got a really great formula right now. So, yeah. Good. Thank you, guys. Our next question is the million dollar question, one that many people came to hear you guys answer today, and that is, what does fall market look like? What are we, what should we expect for Q4 of 2023? And then what should we expect going into next year? And, and Brian, you can talk about this from a mortgage um, standpoint as well. Um, so, Conrad, you are the king sure. of stats. Let's start with you. Yeah, you know what? I, uh, you know, there used to be these great markets when I started about 25, 30 years ago. There was the spring market, you know, and then there was the summer market and the fall market. Now there is all different markets. Uh, the markets are very efficient right now. I think consumers are about everything, price per square foot. So there's an efficiency to the market. There's also compression. So what we saw like month to month, you remember Q1 of 2020, uh, 2023 was kind of deadsville. Then it kind of picked up in, in, in uh, April and then so on and so forth. So we are seeing, we don't see traditional markets anymore. It's kind of moving month to month, month to month. And now I'm seeing the fall, it's moving kind of week to week. What's interesting is that we saw a lull in the first two weeks. They made a, they made a pause announcement. We all thought, oh my God, it's in a, you know, it's just, if they pause, the VOC paused, that this market's gonna take off like a, like a rocket. I, as a matter of fact, we saw appointments down week over week, you know, 20% down from the week before. So it was pretty devastating. Then one number comes out, 4% inflation, and then everybody's jumping all over it. And we went from, you know, five deposits coming in uh, during the, you know, during a regular day to 25, 30 on a weekend coming all in. So people are sensitive and it's up, it's, it's look, it's our, our jobs as realtors and people, professionals in this industry to educate their buyers 
and sellers throughout this whole process. And these numbers do mean, do mean something. The employment numbers that are going to come out, uh, and, and, and it's a parlor game now, guessing what the, uh, I think it's a fun game now that we guess what the BOC is going to do. But I'll tell you something, if there's two consecutive months that they do the same thing, then you're going to see a trend. We haven't seen that at all, right? right. Well, we have seen it on the other increases. There's been two months of increases and, and multiple months of increases, but you haven't seen two months of something going the other way. So when we see that, it'll change. I don't know. I got a 50-50 feeling that on the 26th, it's going to go up a quarter point, which could be could be good. Now they I'll they give you odds on that. Give yeah, okay, yeah. But I, I, I look, guys, it's all about you. And and I will say this: I've done analysis from October 2022 to to today 2022. We have seen list to sales ratios go from 95% of asking back in a, a year ago to tighter 98% to 99% of asking. So that shows you that prices are stabilizing and rates are getting baked into baked into the uh, to the market. Amazing. Thank you, Connor. Brian, what are your thoughts on the Bank of Canada announcement? Yeah, I think, I think it's going to be, as Connor likes to say, a tale of two stories. I think there's what people should be doing, and then I think there's probably what's going to happen in the marketplace as well, too. Uh, my part of the game right now in the BOC is a 25% chance of a rate increase, so 25%. That's one out of four economists is saying you're going to see the increase. 75% are calling a pause. Uh, that could change in 10 minutes. I have no clue, right? So that's October 25th. But what I do think it's going to come out, regardless of whether we see a pause or we see an increase, is more bad news. You're just going to see more bad news in the marketplace, and that's going to get into your buyers' heads and ears because you know 20, uh, Canadians making minimum payments on credit cards are up 20%. Auto loans are getting extended. And you're going to hear the really shitty stories more and more of the leveraged investor, the new construction condo that couldn't close, the, those types of stories, you know, if it bleeds, it reads. Those are the ones you're going to hear about. So those are the ones that you're going to have to really be in the ear of your customer on to combat. Because we all know when you're at, when there's, what did Warren Buffett say? He said when there's blood in the streets, that's when you buy it, even if it's your own, right? So I believe that coming in the fall, we're going to see that blood in the streets. You're going to see all this bad news hit the headlines. It's going to look terrible out there. And normally what people want to do when it's terrible is nothing, right? I'm going to wait. But when we talk about this all the time, that's the best opportunity to buy. If you want to jump into the market and get something that's below market value, take advantage of that you know, scarcity mentality that's going to be happening, that's the opportunity. I think all these things, I think the market does happen fairly quickly, whether we see a pause or an increase in October, I think we'll probably start to see the rates go down in spring. That's my bet for it. I think you'll see it happen a lot quicker because once those bad news happen, I think it'll start to come down spring, maybe early summer is my thought. Good. Rob, what are your thoughts? Um, I, I would suggest if you're signing any listings right now, you get at least a six month or more uh, contract, um, you're going to need it because houses aren't going, you know, selling as fast. The ones that are selling fast are the ones that are priced right. And if you can get buyers, and this is a good time to pick up some good buyers because you're going to look like a hero. Pick up some buyers from open houses or whatever. You uh, take them out, show them some houses. There's, going to be, there's some inventory out there. You can uh, negotiate some really good deals. But again, uh, get long contracts uh, on your uh, listings right now. Good, thank you. So I, mean, you know, I think jumping off of that, there's no denying that things are tough right now. Agents are struggling to adopt new habits, absolutely, and that's one of the reasons that we host, we're hosting an event like this, to make sure that you are surrounded with people who are focused and who are motivated to succeed. Um, I actually was um, at a conference last week and there was a speaker, an accomplished realtor, that talked about the importance of surrounding yourself with the right people and not people who are wallowing during difficult times, but people who you're seeing take action and make changes. So. The point I'm getting to on this is, Brian, I actually saw a video, it was perfect timing, that an interview that you had had where you were talking about the rooms that you find yourself in, about um, along the lines of that you, you find rooms of people that are more successful than you, so that that motivates you to, to do more. Let's talk a bit more about that. Yeah, um, I wasn't sure where you were in the rooms. I was in yeah. college for a second, so <laughs> thank God I went that direction. That could have come in handy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> those ones aren't huge. Okay, I digress. Anyway. Um, yeah, you know, I was recently in a conference in uh, California, and one of the speakers ended up saying, this guy named Phil Heath, he was a seven-time world bodybuilding champion, and he ended up saying, you know, if you think you're doing pretty good, or if you think you're, you know, you got a little bit of swagger, you're in the wrong room. 
And that really hit home to me because I remember going down there and sometimes, you know, I can think I'm doing okay or things are all right. And then I look around and see other people that are doing 10, 20, 30 times more than I am, 20, 30 times more ambitious than I am. And I'm like, wow, I am tiny. I have limited thinking. I have so much more that I can do. And that's, you know, one of the reasons why I love that I get the opportunity to associate with Rob and Conrad. You know, one of my favorite five minutes of every week is when we shut off the podcast and shoot the shit. <laughs> No, I'm, I'm dead serious though. You have no idea how much for someone like that, for someone like me that that means because, you know, when you look at what Rob's doing, he's doing a ton. When you look at what Conrad's doing, he's doing a ton. And I get to be that guy for five minutes and be like, wow, get your shit together, Brian. Do more. Do more. Listen to what they're doing. Right? So I think that's really important. And, and also to, to, uh, to your credit, Rob, to, to putting on events like this and doing things like this. I really think it's important that if you're ever going to get a coach, you know, because I just signed up for a coaching program in the States. He teaches the, the top mortgage brokers in the States, and I have to audition to pay $30,000 to pay to get the privilege of fucking having this guy, so I hope I get in, but anyways, it's another story. I hope I do. But if you sign up for a coaching program, do it, and don't change it. Do the program until you make money, until you make more money than the guy teaching it. It's one of the biggest mistakes I ever see is someone end up saying, if you make, and to Rob's point, if you make more money than Rob, tweak his program. If you make more money than somebody else, tweak their program. But if you don't, just do the program. And I find that getting into rooms like that and finding out things like that, it's made me, I recently went out on a fitness journey. I'm, when they tell me what to do, because they're the best, I'm not tweaking it with cookies in the afternoon. I'm doing what they tell me to do, so. Go ahead, Rob. Yeah, so when I uh, go to uh, conferences, the one thing I, uh, uh, there was one, a couple of them in particular, and, and Conrad, I know you guys uh, understand this, is um, I would call in advance, and they would sit us at different tables, especially if there's special seating. I would call the organizer and I'd say, I want to be at, at a certain table that are the guys that are doing all the, the high, the big volume of business. I want to sit beside these guys. That's how you do it. Like you, like when I go to conferences, I go through marketplace by myself. I, I want to find out what's going on. Um, it, it's good to go with friends. There's no doubt about it. But sometimes you get distracted by talking uh, a lot with your friends and not really focusing on what you're there for. But when I go, I'm, I I want to sit beside the guys that are doing double, triple the business I'm doing. I want to see what's happening. For instance, uh, Bomb Bomb when it came out. You guys probably found out about Bomb Bomb just maybe not just not too many few years ago. I was one of the probably the beginners that Bomb Bomb came out. I was walking through a marketplace and I saw what they had and I said, "Wow!" So and we were using Bomb Bomb years before anybody even in Ontario was using it. And uh, but anyway, like that, you just gotta surround yourself with the right people, and your business will increase. And that, that that's how it's done. You just gotta rub elbows with guys that are doing their own business. Yeah, I, I have a different approach. I have this kind of roster of eight. I've got a, uh, and, and now, now some of these people are staff people that I brought on as staff people. But when I first started out, these were people I just would call on. I have an innovator, somebody really tech person, like a Holly, <laughs> right? I have, I have a really great marketer, a target marketer, somebody that, uh, well, now it's on staff, but I used to go to a, a, an agency for marketing advice, so I have that. Uh, I have a maverick. I, you gotta have a maverick. You gotta have a guy that's kind of, or a guy or gal that kind of pushes the envelope and things like that. So when I'm thinking of pushing the envelope, I usually go to my maverick all the time. Uh, then I've got, I've got an expert, uh, and I got Brian, he's a mortgage expert, so I got a bunch of experts in those kind of criteria. Then I've got somebody that's elite in my industry, and, and Rob is the elite in this industry. And, and, and he's a phone call away. We were just talking about our, our phone calls are like six, seven seconds, but we, we get a lot accomplished. But you need somebody who's elite and be, listen, I'll tell you something, reach out to people. You know what, it's an honor for, to be somebody's elite uh, consultant. Uh, I need an engineer, I need an engineer, I need somebody to help me with systems and that could be a coach or something along that line. And then there's another one that you kind of say, you forget a little bit about, you need a community person or a cause person because we always got to give back. 
and that's one of the things that uh, my family and myself are very big on giving back and and we consult with others that that are giving people and community leaders and and i have a few of those that that i contact on a regular basis so yeah that's you've got to have that, that a cast of of eight people in your life and if you can be as lucky as i am that's 50 percent of them you they're on your payroll it's even better but i tell you when you start out it's great to reach out to, to people like that well you guys picked a good one to be in today for sure um, so I'm going to switch gears a little bit now. We have a lot of new agents in the room. Um, this was a question that was submitted multiple times. As a new agent, what, do, what advice do you have for a realtor that's starting out to establish themselves in the industry, to build a client base? Like, how do they begin? So, Rob, I'm going to start with you. So, if you're a new agent, congratulations. <laughs> and um, I'm going to tell you, the one thing about agents when they start out, they think this business is easy, and it's not easy. Um, you can spend maybe one or two hours every morning, you know, following up and, and just on everybody that you met, calling them and everything else like that. But, but, and that's just staying in touch. So now that's easy. Now, that's easier than uh, getting a job and working for eight hours and working for somebody else that you don't like and, and continuing that for the next 25 years. So that's one aspect. Just give me a picture of that. But the other thing is, if you want now business, uh, I'm gonna tell you right now, now business is open houses. That's now business. Like, it, like this business is easy. It's just that I think everybody makes it complicated in their head. Like when I, when I first started, I, like I knew zero. And it, there was, I was on the phones, calling and calling, made appointments and did open houses. And I grew it and grew it and grew it to a point where, and, and where it is today. And every one of you that has a, a license to sell real estate has that opportunity to do that. And I just don't get it that somebody will wake up in the morning and look and shuffle their desk around saying, okay, now I'm organized, but not making any phone calls. This is, guys, I'm telling you, you gotta get on the phones and, and follow up and stay in touch with your clients and you will, you will make money. And uh, I, hey, listen, if, if you guys wanna drop out and quit this business, I, you guys are gonna look back years down the road and say, you know what, I really messed up and I should have I worked a little harder. And that, I'm telling you, so you got your license, just do it. Good, who wants next? Sure, I'll, I'll go. Um, yeah, I, some of you may know who I am or, or what have you, but I grew up in a real estate family and uh, my parents had a very small brokerage. And when we were kids, we knew when interest rates uh, went to 19 and 20%. Yep, yeah, back in uh, 80, 81, and 21 and 22. We knew when Stelco went on strike because you know our, our business uh, rose and fell with the market. Stelco goes on strike, a lot of people aren't buying and stuff like that in Hamilton. So I, I decided that out of that, again, I, the, the, the theme of trauma, out of the trauma of that, okay, the, the, un, the insecurity of that, I decided I wanted to build a business that would grow every year and transcend any market. And we started with one office and then we, we dominated that market area, that geographic area, and we, we, we opened up another office and expanded. I tell you, if you're not growing every year, you are dying. Okay, that's from my friend, uh, John Fortino, the founder of Fortino's told me when I was a young man, if you're not growing, you are dying. And, and you're not giving any justice to your clientele. You have to dominate different niches. You may have to, you start by dominating uh, a geographic area. And I know golfies did that. They dominated that Grimsby area. And then they expanded with, uh, you know, for sake of a better word, military precision and expanded throughout the region. And we did the same thing. So I'll tell you something. I, the, the greatest thing I did was uh, opening up in Oakville. I'll tell you that that, that changed uh, the trajectory of our business. We are just down three transactions from last year. Year to date, we're up 12%. There's not a single brokerage that is up 12% in units. And I will tell you something too. Rob is the only team I know at his level that is actually surpassing numbers of 2021. So, which is the pinnacle year. That's what it's all about. Winning in every market and growing your business Find those geographic niches, find those other niches that people are looking for. The investor niche, you had a speaker about investors. Investors now account for 30% of the buying public. First time buyers are down to like in the low 20s. So again, this is what, it, what it's all about and, and creating that great content that draws people. Brian, we also have a number of mortgage agents in the audience here today. So do you have any advice for new mortgage folks getting into business? Yeah, and you know what, to piggyback off that last question too, when I was in those, like you listen to what Conrad just said there, his standard is not, oh, the market's down 
Rob's standard is not, oh, the market's down 20%, so it's okay if I'm doing kind of crappy this year. No. So when I'm in that room, I'm challenged to grow and say, well, listen, how am I going to make Mission 35 grow in this market as well, too? I'm happy. I'm not at the same level that they are, but like, I'm happy to say that we're even this year when the national mortgage broker is down 20% because I'm living into different standards and we're growing that way. So I would say for new mortgage agents, even new realtors, align yourself with a great mortgage agent. <laughs> okay, sorry. I had to do it, okay? But anyways, the reality is you have to have like a power team, right? I know I've heard Conrad talk about it before. You know, you build that circle around people. You have the realtor, mortgage agent. You have your lawyer, your insurance person, the appraiser. You have everybody in that tight-knit circle. Like, I built my business off of that. I still think it's a great edification piece. Everybody knows everybody, and everybody's talking good things about everybody. If you don't have that, you should have that. Uh, Rob mentioned it as well too, like just a long-term vision, like don't, don't quit. Like you guys have such an opportunity to make a ton of money here and one of the biggest mistakes I see, and mortgage agents too, an agent come up to me and start equating his dollar per hour for some activities. And I'm like, dude, you are farming right now. You are planting seeds right now. You're getting paid nothing for what you're doing. And if you ever heard Rob's first, when he gets started and he does like, you had the two headsets going, like one, 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 like, you still gotta do that stuff today, right? And then you will get paid an obscene amount of money for doing what feels like a little amount of work later. But right now, you won't. So it's kind of like, just set that expectation, because if you have an expectation, it's gonna be better. It's the root of all disappointment. You're setting yourself up for failure. Stick it out for the long term. Do the work, do the unsexy, shitty work and it will pay off in a huge harvest later. I actually really love that story. Rob, do you want to tell it with your, how you would set up the phones when you were just starting out? Yeah, so back when I started out, there wasn't the technology there is today, so I would get the uh, two headset, you know the old yeah. Plantronics? Yeah. You know, I'd have them, uh, like a, uh, both of them on each ear, you'd have the one ear piece and the mouthpiece, and I would put, I would have two of them, and, and then I would have two phones in front of me. And I would dial the first number. As that number is ringing, I'm keying up the second phone call. And if the first one didn't pick up, I'd hang up and dial the last number on the second uh, phone, and then just kept going back and forth, back and forth. And I would have cue cards, right? So I'd say, in my, in my uh, Rolodex or, or, or set that I would uh, focus on, uh, like organizing, would have the, the days of the of the, uh, the days of the month and the month of the, uh, of the year. So if I had to follow up with 20 people in January, uh, you know, so they'd be all in, in that uh, 1 to 31st there. But, uh, but yeah, and that's how I did it. Like, just, uh, you know, but right now we got technology. I wish I wish I had that technology back then because it, it'd be a, diff a different story. I would reach uh, uh, my goals a lot quicker uh, if, if I had that technology. How many years ago was that? Just to put it in perspective. I, I, I just, I just, I can't believe that. 25 years in the business. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just to put that, that uh, the, what you see before you today is 25 years in the making. Yeah, right? like yeah, that's crazy. 25 year overnight success. Yeah. That's <laughs> it. Yeah. yeah. All right, you guys, we're going to close this out with one final question. In one sentence, what is the single most important piece of advice or insight you'd like to share with all of us, all of the realtors and mortgage agents, perhaps, um, here today um, to thrive and excel in this industry? So, Conrad, I'll let you start. I think just be consistent with great content on a regular basis. There's only two things your clients care about you and, and, and your business, that you're always thinking of them, so it's gotta be tailor-made content for them, and uh, that you're an expert in the industry, okay? And really look at refining uh, the way you generate leads and things like that, and look at your goals. Like, Brian, I know I'm going a little longer, but I love what, you know, Brian talks about, everybody says about money, money, money all the time. I never looked at it that way. I, I looked at uh, these kind of uh, byproduct goals, like how do I get more, and, and Brian's done this great, how do I get more Google reviews? And what that asset is going to be in the long run. How do I get more of my sphere of influence? Like maybe I got 10% of my sphere of influence either referring me. How do I go next year and get 20% of my sphere of influence? And then deconstruct it and build a system around it. I think those, those are the critical pieces that you have to be involved in uh, as a realtor these days. Thank you, Brian. Uh, I think I would say, you know, staying positive has served me very, very well. I think people bring opportunities to people that are positive all the time, right? I've never seen Rob in a bad mood. I've never seen Conrad in a bad mood when he's got 10 phone calls going on. These guys both are probably some of the busiest people, but they're not in a bad mood. They're optimistic, 
right? So you can share that mindset, and I think people bring that opportunity to you. And I think, you know, just to sum it all up too, I would end up saying, uh, I tell my daughter this all the time, I just end up saying, if you never quit, you'll never lose. Don't quit. Yeah. Love it, Rob. Podcast books and function. And I, I'm telling you, that's what's it going to take. Because I'll tell you, I know you guys look at it and say, well, that function is going to cost me X amount of dollars. Well, it's going it, to, you can't afford not to go to any function. I'm telling you, you've got to listen to podcasts, you've got to read books, and go to functions. You've got to go at least three or four a year. And I know it seems like dramatic, but every time you leave a function, you get that spirit, that, that energy that, that came from that function that just gives you that energy to, to, to start picking up the phone, start doing what they're saying to do, and that'll help you, you know, generate more business. And then the next function, the same thing, you need that fuel and that, those functions, those podcasts, those books are going to create that fuel, that energy that you need to, to succeed. Can you tell even Rob's own events feel them, as you can tell? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you guys very much. Brian and Conrad, I appreciate you guys. And Rob, how about you stay on the stage with me to wrap things up here? Thanks. Thank you.